Thank you for coming. I think this will be a, a good two days. I thank the National Academy for organizing this and sponsoring this, and uh, of course uh, for the Sackler Foundation for providing the resources to actually run this kind of thing. Uh, I'm not going to give an extensive introduction into the symposium, uh, but let me just start maybe by pointing out this figure, which is, I'm somewhat embarrassed about this figure because I made it many, many years ago with Glenn Northcutt, my thesis advisor, and uh, I've quibbled with this figure, you know, it's sort of limited in many ways, but it, it does kind of work to show that there are levels of biological organization, and if you look at the program over the next couple of days, it, it, it tries in every session to have people that go across various levels, and, and that was by design. Many other aspects of the program are not going to be perfect. It's hard to construct a program like this where you have you know, a very strong thematic progression, and, uh, and I think in a way you're going to have to, as an audience, just integrate across many sessions and talks, and hopefully we'll have some good discussions. Uh, so. That's just by way of intro introduction. It also allows me to introduce the topic of my talk, which is uh, the evolution of development. So uh, the question of how you go from genes to morphology, and these arrows here, or these lines, are, is supposed to represent development. And let me introduce a little bit uh, further what I mean by, uh, by uh, evolution and development. Uh, Many of you are familiar with it. It's a big field now. It wasn't such a big field when I was a graduate student, and I was introduced to it when as a graduate student in Glenn Northcott's lab, partly because we uh, read uh, as a group Ontology and Phylogy by Stephen Jay Gould. A lot of people like to complain about his various idiosyncrasies, but he was very influential uh, in uh, stimulating my thinking if only because he made me le read a lot of other books, including old books, and uh, even here, this maybe bragging somewhat, but I remember going through the trouble of trying to find a copy of Von Baer's uh, books, which took a long time through interlibrary loan to get, and fortunately, you know, not everyone can read German, and it's kind of hard to read, but you can at least say you've read them at some point. Uh, much more informative, actually, and easier to get and read is, is this little book, and I highly recommend it if you've never thought about uh, the evolution of development. Uh, look at that little book. It's a, it's a very cool book. But you can read and read and read, and sometimes you wonder, you know, it doesn't necessarily click right away. It clicked for me, uh, by which I mean I really started understanding what this all was all about when I read this, uh, this quote in a, in a uh, book by uh, William Bateson. Uh, if a man were asked to make a wax model of the skeleton of one animal from the skeleton of another, he would perhaps set about it by making small additions in, to and subtractions from its several parts. But the natural process differs in one great essential from this. For in nature, the body of one individual has never been the body of its parent and is not formed by a plastic operation from it. But the new body is made again from the beginning, just as if the wax model had gone back into the melting pot before the new model was begun. And that, because I'm a, maybe because I'm a fairly visual person, that made me realize for the first time that hey, a lot of us evolutionary biologists have been thinking of evolutionary transformations as transformations of adults. You just sort of, you know, stick on a bigger nose, or you pull here, or you pull there. Uh, and that really wasn't, isn't how it works. You have to, in each generation, as he said, sort of start from scratch. And then the question becomes, over evolutionary time, how does development change so that instead of going to this adult phenotype, you, you deviate slightly and you get, end up with a different phenotype? So that, for me, uh, was sort of a, a formative moment where I said, oh, I should study that more, you know, I should look into that. And the first time I really started to think about this was in the context of thinking about bird brains, and particularly the bird teal encephalon. So these are budgies, budgerigars, I've worked on them for some time. This is the brain, roughly the right size here. There's a lot of brain in that head. Uh, and there's a very large teal encephalon here. And if you take a section through it, it kind of looks like this. It's a very solid piece of tissue. There's not a lot of ventricle there. Okay, so not only is it large, if you look at it like this, it's also large in the sense that it's, it's solid. There's an awful lot of neurons there. The other thing that's, of course, striking is if you're looking for something like a neocortex, as you can see here in the human brain, where is the neocortex in this bird brain? And that question has been debated for a really long time. Where is the homologue of mammalian neocortex in the bird brain? And conversely, where is this thing 
Yeah, the, if you, you can think of it developmentally especially, you can see that there's a, basically a ridge that protrudes into the ventricle and keeps growing and growing, and at some point the ventricles get reduced to these tiny little slits. Well, where is that ridge in a mammalian brain? Okay, so those were very uh, important questions that a lot of people had debated. One of the dominant ideas at the time that I started thinking about this was that actually this doesn't look like cortex, but it actually is the homologue of neocortex. That was one of the main ideas. But it appears now, in part because of the EVO-DEVO approach, that that is really not the way uh, uh, it goes. And it's shown here in, in, in this slide. Now, I contributed a little bit to this effort, but most of the work is based, uh, uh, based on the, the work of people like Luis uh, Puelles and Loretta Medina. Is, uh, this particular figure is from her. So the idea is this. When you look at a young embryo brain, young embryonic brain, of a bird and a mammal, they look rather similar. And these are here side views, sort of face to face. Uh, and especially if you stain for various uh, transcription factors and so forth, you can see that even the subdivisions of the forebrain are fairly similar in size and relative position between these two uh, uh, groups of animals. If you then look at later time points, and now here we're switching to cross sections, uh, the left here and the right for a mammal, uh, you can see that in mammals, this red part here, the developing neocortex, gets quite large as you go to the adult, adult uh, phenotype. In contrast, in birds, the, this part that we call the dorsal pallium, or the neocortex homolog, doesn't get very large, stays relatively small. However, this ventral pallium, which develops into structures like uh, called nidopallium and archopallium in birds. They used to have other names. The names are not that important. Becomes very large. So most of that ridge that I was talking about that accounts for the shrinking vent ventricles uh, is really this ventral pallium derivative. In contrast, in mammals, this ventral pallium stays relatively small and ends up in a place down here. Uh, my pointer is freaking out. Anyway. Uh, and Become, develops into a complex set of structures, part of the amygdala, part of the olfactory cortex, and so forth. So that to me was exciting because it has said that by looking at developmental data and sort of comparing development across different species, you can clarify some questions that had buggled, <laughs> buggled, had, had bugged people for a long time uh, about what's homologous to what. And that to me, that was very satisfying. But that's also only one aspect of what I consider evo-devo neurobiology. Uh, another one is to try harder to understand variation, not between birds and mammals, but even among birds. To see if we can understand how do different bird brains, how do they become different from one another in evolution. And the evo-devo way of thinking about that is how does how was development changed in one species relative to another so that you end up with a different phenotype? And we worked on mam on birds, not that have any, any particular preference for birds over mammals. It's just it's a lot easier to do comparative embryology on birds than uh, than in mammals. And we worked on a lot of different species, of course, chicken. We also worked on bobwhite quail. Nice, you, can, you just mail order eggs for a lot of these. Uh, it's kind of it's convenient. Uh, uh, people like to shoot these. That's why there are breeders out there who, uh, who, will, who will breed them. We bred in the lab. We bred some parakeets, some zebra finches. And of course, getting duck eggs is not so hard. So what kind of variation were we going to look at? And here we focused on what is sometimes called telencephalization. Uh, so if you look at the telencephalon, just ask what percentage of the brain is telencephalon, you get a fair bit of variation in that. So here's, on this axis is telencephalic fraction. Uh, so uh, a macaw, for example, has almost 80% of his brain is telencephalon. And you look at a, at a small chicken-like bird, it's only 45%. So there's a lot of variation. An interesting aspect of this is that as you go to larger overall brain weights, that telencephalic fraction goes up. And there's uh, Barbara Finley has we've done a lot of work on that, and others have as well. And I'm not going to talk about that today. But that's, it's sort of understood why that happens. What I'm, I'm going to talk about more is the fact that in some birds, even at the same total brain weight, you have a jump in telencephalic fraction. That is, even at the same brain size, they have a proportionately larger telencephalon. 
And this is mostly the parrots and the songbirds. And I have them here in different color because we used to think a lot of my old, early work actually was based on the assumption that they're independently evolved uh, groups of birds that are very distant on the uh, bird uh, phylogenetic tree. But recent data actually suggests that they're actually very closely related to one another. So, uh, but it doesn't really matter for what I'm going to talk about today. So what we wanted to do is find out what is the developmental mechanism that allows, if you will, uh, birds, uh, parrots and songbirds to have a proportionately larger telencephalon than other birds. And we started this in a fairly pedestrian way, you know, if you will. We just started collecting embryos and of different ages and started looking at them. So here are three different embryos from a parakeet, from young to old. And here's a bobwhite quail. Uh, it's, you have to be a little careful when you do this kind of comparative embryology about which species you compare because the developmental rates may vary and sizes may vary and so forth. And we thought very hard before we selected these species. Uh, I won't go into the details of that, but uh, they were in a way a fortuitous choice of species. And here's a forebrain. These arrows here point to the, the forebrain. Uh, and you can, maybe you can see that the quail uh, Wait, this is, I switched these. Uh, yeah, at least I know my embryos. I don't just go by the, you know. Uh, it's like, these are the parakeets. They have a, 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 they, they have a larger uh, uh, forebrain. You can even see that in, a, in, a, uh, in an embryo. But of course, you, can't, you can only see so much if you look at an embryo from the, uh, from the outside. So what we did is we took sections through here and we did a rather painstaking sort of reconstruction of the volume of these different parts at different ages and you get a growth curve. Okay, and here's the age. This is actually absolute time. They develop at roughly the same rate. Uh, and here's not telencephalic fraction, but the, the ratio of the telencephalon to the medulla or the lower part of the brainstem. And the point here, the important point is that the uh, parakeets and quail, for most of their development, the, that ratio of the telencephalon to the medulla is actually the same, but it's very late in development that the parakeet suddenly has this telencephalic growth spurt. So you can imagine the brains are basically going on fairly similar, and then in parrots, actually most of the growth spurt happens after hatching. The parrots are precocial, they hatch earlier than, than the quail, but that doesn't really matter in a way. It's just like, when do you come out of the egg? It's just one aspect of development. Uh, Relatively late, the parakeets suddenly have this big growth spurt in the telencephalon. So that already gave us a clue about what might be the developmental mechanism. And that is, it, it can't be something that happens really early in development, like maybe a patterning thing where the, there's, a, there's a stage in brain development when you sort of chop up the developing nervous system and you say, you're going to become telencephalon, you're going to become tectum. And you can imagine that, you know, some uh, evolution sort of played with that parameter and said, we're going to just from the outset make a larger tail encephalon. That can't be going on here, right? Because uh, the change happens so late. So what else could be going on? Uh, the bottom line answer is that there, the par parrots seem to delay tail encephalic neurogenesis. So I have to back up a little bit and tell you how we, how we studied this. So if you take a developing brain uh, in, a, in a young embryo, the interesting thing about the progenitor cells of that brain is that they like to stick close to that ventricle. Uh, they form a, a ventricular zone that's fairly densely packed, all these dividing cells, and they just divide in place there. When progenitor cells, at some point they stop dividing, right, and they start differentiating, and that's what we call their birth date. We sort of say, okay, now you're becoming post-mitotic, or are you becoming a young neuron or glial cell? Uh, they then leave this zone and form a separate zone here. You can see that it's less dense, and those are, that's the post-mitotic zone. And you can see that even without a lot of fancy imaging techniques, it's a fairly clear boundary. Now, if you look at a parakeet and a quail at the same age, you could, we saw that uh, the parakeet, this post-mitotic layer is actually thinner than it is in quail, whereas the ventricular zone seems roughly the same thickness. To quantify that and look at many different brain regions, we calculate something called a proliferative zone fraction, which is simply what percentage of this entire zone is proliferative. Okay, and then you, it's 
it goes from one early in development when all the cells are progenitors to almost zero when basically all the progenitors are used up and you just have a, a, a built brain. And you look at this curve and you, let's look first at the medulla, which are the triangles here. You can see that the data points are almost you know, perfectly the same. So the medulla and in parakeets and quail develop at pretty much the same rate. If you look in the telencephalon, you can see that the, the cur growth curve here, or the, the function, is basically shifted to the right. Okay? So at any, at, at, at any given age, the parrot has a larger uh, proportion of the, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the brain is still progenitor cells. So what that means, basically, is that uh, you have a delay in neurogenesis. And, and to, to, another way to think about that is, what, what, what does delaying neurogenesis really give you? It means that the progenitor cells go through an extra round of cell division, or half of the round of cell division, or a little bit, little bit more cell division, right? Which means the precursor pool expands further before you start making neurons. And that's a very, if you think about it, that's a very powerful way to enlarge your structure because it's basically exponential, right? You delay it for one cell division, you're going to double the size. You delay it for an extra cell division, you quadruple the size and so forth. So it's a very powerful mechanism. And we did the same thing in songbirds, and we find exactly the same kind of phenomenon in songbirds, which for us was very exciting initially. It's like, oh, independently evolved, and they do the same thing. And then the taxonomists come along and say, no, songbirds and parrots are really very closely related, but it still makes sense. Uh, OK. Uh, now, there are other ways of changing the brain. It's not always delays in neurogenesis. And one of those involves the optic tectum. Okay, so the optic tectum is part of the midbrain. And when we were looking at these embryos, we noticed that chicken-like birds, now, now here, it's the right way around. Okay? <laughs> these are really the quail and these are the parakeets. And you can see here's this big structure here. That's the optic tectum, the roof of the midbrain. And parakeets, not so much. See this? This looks, this looks almost like a tumor, right? I mean, it, it's very, very impressive. Uh, if you look at adult birds, it's not so obvious, but in the embryos, it's fairly, fairly obvious. Here is roughly, these are, uh, this is a quail at hatching and a parakeet one week after hatching. You, again, you can see the tectum is quite a bit bigger. And when you do the proper growth curves, uh, looking here at the tectum to medulla uh, ratio, you can see that uh, the quail has a larger tectum pretty much from the earliest stages that we can identify a tectum. So here we have, it seems, a case where there's a, been a boundary shift of some sort. Some must have been a change in early brain patterning, right? Because uh, there's it, it changes there very early. So when Luke McGowan joined the lab uh, as a graduate student, I, uh, I said, you know, maybe you could test that hypothesis explicitly because, like I said, we were just using standard stains where you get to a really early embryo, you can't really tell anymore what's tectum and what isn't. So, but there are molecular markers that you can use. And unfortunately, there aren't any really good markers that are just selective for the midbrain tectum at that early age. But we decided to use a, a sort of definition by exclusion approach. So there is a good marker called PAC6 for the developing forebrain. Uh, and there is a marker for the uh, hindbrain called GBX2. And then the midbrain is basically the non unstained area in between. So we actually here use the same colors for the, for the two genes because there's no need to, to tell them apart. So this is a side view of an embryo at this early age. Here's a dorsal view of a quail and a parakeet. And it's a little hard to tell in these pictures, but uh, Luke actually developed some methods for Finding, identifying boundaries that are fairly objective and so you're not just guessing where the boundary might be. And the point is that the parakeets, when you look at that empty region, it seems to be shorter than it is in quail relative to things like the length of the forebrain or the thickness of the ventricular zone. And he quantified that here in these two different ways of looking at it. You have to be careful because some embryos are bigger than smaller, others are smaller, and so absolute size, absolute length isn't such a good measure. You have to normalize to something, and you, we normalize to various different things. And uh, the long story short, basically he found that at these early ages, looking with these patterning genes, the parakeets already have a smaller tectum than the quail. 
for most evolutionary biologists, at some point you ask yourself, well, so which one is the derived and which one is the primitive condition, right? Is it the case that the parrots decrease their tectum or is it that the chicken-like birds uh, increase their tectum? And uh, I expected that the chicken should be the primitive condition and the parrot, but that's not what happened. We looked at a lot of different birds and this was uh, mostly Christine Charvet. She even looked at uh, emus and, and, you know, that's where the ducks started coming in. And basically, the chicken-like birds just have an overgrown tectum. It's not quite clear, you know, people always ask me, so what's the significance of that? I don't really know. Uh, could be, you know, things like pegging at grain, you know, might be good to have nice uh, uh, spatial resolution in your visual system, good hand be uh, eye beak coordination, that kind of thing. But that's really just speculation. In the long run, I'd like to uh, explore that a little bit more. Okay, so we now have sort of two developmental mechanisms that allow you to change, change uh, the size of a particular region. We have these early boundary shifts and we have delays in neurogenesis. And I really wanted to know, you know, what's the difference? Whether you do it this way or that, what are the implications of doing it one way versus the other? I already mentioned that, that you know, from a theoretical point of view, delaying neurogenesis is very powerful. Uh, but uh, there might be other consequences to that. And so uh, you, you might ask, for example, does the tectum, all, you always do it by, if you want to make a larger or smaller tectum, do you always do it by this mechanism or do you sometimes do it by another mechanism? And I thought, that's going to be hard to answer because we're going to have to do a lot of correlative studies, you know, a lot of species, and, look, and it's going to get complicated and we'll never know for sure. So I thought it'd be really nice if we, maybe we could transition into more of experimental mode where we start manipulating uh, brain development and, and maybe test some of these hypotheses experimentally. And uh, a model in my mind of what the kind of thing that one might be able to do came from this study by uh, Enjin Chen and Chris Walsh in 2002, where they took mice and uh, created transgenic mice that constitutively uh, overexpressed or ex constitutively expressed, uh, uh, um, they, they overexpressed a constitutively active form of beta catenin in, 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 uh, in the entire brain. And what they get, uh, got was this very unusual brain. Uh, that has, it's a mouse, okay, and it has this very large brain with all these folds in there, and of course a normal mouse brain does not have a, a foliated cortex. Now what was going on there, they looked fairly carefully and they said, oh, beta catenin, what, one of the things it does there is it delays neurogenesis, right? So that's the sort of thing that we were, had been thinking about already. Yeah, that makes sense. If you delay neurogenesis, you're going to uh, and expand the precursor pool and you're going to get this brain overgrowth. It was also interesting, of course, that as you make it larger, it starts getting folded and that's, that's something I've always been fascinated in. But it's very, they, they didn't follow this up very much because it's actually hard to follow this up because you basically have a line, line of mice and it's embryonic lethal and you can't do a whole lot else with it. Uh, and of course they also had other interests so they moved on to other things. But I thought this kind of thing would be fun to do, particularly if you could find a way to make a mouse brain larger without breaking it. Because if you look carefully, I mean, it's, it's bigger, but it's not, you know, it's kind of broken also. So that is, has been an, a, a sort of a guiding inspiration for the kind of work we want to do. And I'll, I'll acknowledge right now, we're not there yet, okay? It's very hard, to, I think, to make a larger brain that isn't broken. And that's one of the, the mysteries right now that drives me is try to figure out how do you make changes that are actually viable? But experimentally, what we settled on uh, was we tried some things with beta catenin. Uh, Luke has been trying very hard to electroporate in beta catenin into chicken embryos and so forth. But it's complicated. It's difficult. And we hit on something that, that, that is much easier, although maybe also confusing. But uh, it's just to inject FGF2 as a growth factor uh, that has been shown in mammals to delay uh, neurogenesis in the telencephalon. And we thought, oh, maybe it's going to do the same thing in birds. And of course, it's very nice to inject into birds uh, because the mom is not attached, right, and compared to, a, to, a, to a, a mammal. And we inject around day four. And we started by injecting, you know, trying to inject the tissue itself. But it's very hard, very thin tissue. I showed you how thin that, that developing brain is. So we just inject it into the ventricle, which in, even in mammals, that seems to, to, to work 
And so the idea is that probably it goes everywhere, and we didn't quite know where to expect an effect. Uh, but we saw a very strong effect in the tectum. Okay, this is a control chicken embryo. They already have a large tectum, as I pointed out. This is all chicken now. But if you look uh, in one of these if, uh, FGF2 injected embryos, it's, it's a huge tectum. It almost looks like bunny ears, you know, uh, to me. And if you section through it, this is what a normal tectum should look like. There's some incipient layers here. Uh, and this is the FGF2 treated animals. It's just, it's very much a larger ventricular surface area. So if you compare here, the, the, the surface, the internal surface. Also the volume, even though you know, it's thinner, you can see that already, the, uh, the uh, volume is, is enlarged. You know, take a closer look. This is what a uh, normal tectum looks like at this uh, particular stage, which is day, uh, embryonic day seven. Uh, the ventricle would be here. This is that proliferative zone that I was talking about. And these are all post-proliferative cells that are starting to form one layer here, and you can see cells are migrating up here. In the FGF2-treated animals, it looks very different. The first thing is you, you don't have this thick post-proliferative or post-mitotic layer, right? And that's the sort of thing that is indicative of a delay in neurogenesis, right? Uh, and it's also wavy. That was very confusing to us because ventricular zones are almost always have a smooth border like that, and we weren't sure what's going on here. Maybe, maybe it just looks confusing, but we, we stained with anti-PCNA, which should label only proliferating cells, and we see the same kind of waviness. So we're still not sure exactly what, what's going on here, but it just seems that, uh, so, uh, that, that, the post that, that the proliferating cells have, have lost some sort of cohesion, and you know, we're not sure what's going on there. Uh, Quantifying this, the, the, the thickness is much reduced in day seven, and the proliferative zone fraction, again, this thing of what percentage of the thickness here is occupied by proliferating cells versus non-proliferating cells is, is uh, much higher in the FGF2-treated animals. So we're pretty sure that what we've done is we've delayed neurogenesis, and that's why it's larger. I should say, Luke is in the process of doing some uh, special BRDU labeling experiments to just nail that down completely. Um, this slide, not all that important. I just want to show you that what I showed you before is day seven. Now we're talking day 12, but it's still the same, same kind of deficit uh, or, or same kind of difference. Uh, the FGF2 treated animals have a larger tectum, no matter whether you look at absolute volume or you normalize it to some other part of the brain. The, the ventricular surface is much larger, so it's this giant balloon and it's thinner. We're actually, you know, we're a little confused about why it's thinner. I expect there is some cell death uh, going on, and that might be part of why it's thinner, even at the stage where really a lot of proliferation has, is done. It should be, actually, it should be a little bit thicker. Okay. But here's what got me really excited about this, is this is what a normal FGF2 uh, chicken look, should look like in the tectum. This is a similar section to one of these FGF2 treated animals. And you can see, the first thing you might see is there are these folds here in the back. Okay, so this is like, oh my god, I'm finally getting to where Anjan Chen and, uh, and Chris Walsh were many years ago, but uh, now in a chicken. I should say, there aren't, I, there aren't, I am not aware of any animals that have a folded uh, tectum, so this is very, very unusual. We also know that there's something strange going on here at the lateral surface. This is showing you a larger uh, magnified look at it. This is a normal tectum. You can see these nice layers. Uh, depending on how you count, you can get up to 14 different layers in a, in a bird tectum. Uh, the important point is here's the FGF2 treated animals. The layers are also wavy. Okay? And we, we, in the lab, we thought, you know, what, what should we refer to these? And we, we kind of call them volcanoes now because uh, there is you know, it seems like they're rising, the, 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 the plates are rising, and then there's a, often a central channel through here. I was thinking we should call them maybe the, the pimples of the tectum, but, but the lab has voted me down and said the volcano sounds a lot more scientific. So uh, We're still trying to understand exactly what causes both the volcanoes and the folding, okay? And we're, we are now trying to, to uh, 
understand that um, more carefully. And part of the answer, we think, is that it's across many embryos, it seems that the folds always happen away from the skull. I should show you here maybe in the last picture again. See how here's the skull? And the, 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 the volcanoes always happen in, when the brain is basically very close to the skull. I don't want to say in contact with, because I'm not sure exactly what is in between. But uh, that's where you get these, these little volcanoes. And the f large folds basically happen when you're away from the skull in, in more uh, in, uh, space not near the skull. And this is just a very nice example showing you basically, as soon as you get away from the skull, you get these, the lamination becomes more normal and you get these big folds. We think that's one clue to what's going on. The other clue is when uh, Luke looked, uh, I should say most of his work is done by Luke McGowan, who is here in the audience somewhere, and so if you have questions about it now, you should talk to him. Uh, he noticed that the, when you look at where the volcanoes are, and you look out here, this is actually the pia mater, okay? One of the membranes, one of the meninges around the brain, and it's supposed to be continuous, but there seem to be holes above, more or less above each of the volcanoes. And even in this particular case, you can see there are cells that seem to have basically, almost like a real volcano, okay? Basically, the, the cells have spewed through these holes and ended up in the space uh, uh, of, of the meninges there, between the pia and the dura. Because it's hard to tell from these kinds of nissel stains, is that really pia, are you sure? He then did an anti-laminin stain because uh, PIA secretes laminin and, uh, as, as, a, as an adhesion molecule. And in a normal embryo, that, that should be a continuous layer of laminin. But here you can see above the volcanoes, your counter stain, there are disruptions, actual holes in the laminin de de uh, deposition. Okay, so that was our second clue. And then uh, we started to develop a model of how this might work. And please understand this is a working model. I don't want to call it a tentative model, but definitely a model that might, be, uh, might have to be amended. Um, but we think it's, it's interesting enough to point out. So as many of you know, if you look at normal development of the brain, or certainly the tectum, uh, the progenitors are actually radial cells that have a radial process that go all the way up to the pia. And they have little end feet that are sort of anchored to the pia, and as development proceeds, what you first get is you get multiplication, proliferation of these progenitors, and that gives you a tangential expansion. Basically, they all stay down here, but there are more and more of them, so that, that's what blows up the balloon initially, because you get a tangential expansion and very little change in thickness. But then, you, once neurogenesis starts, you have, start getting post-proliferative cells, newly born cells, that start migrating, often along these radial processes, away from the proliferating cells and toward the pia. Here, these colors are supposed to be some sort of gradient, right? We don't actually know, especially in the tectum, what tells these cells where to go, how far to migrate, but the assumption is that there's some sort of signaling gr molecule gradient there. Could be relin, could be retinoic acid, could be something else. That tells them, basically, where to go, and then they form a lamina there. Okay, now what happens when we inject the FGF2 that's shown here in the middle row, or at least one of the possibilities of what can happen, and that is uh, the idea here is that FGF2 expands the proliferative pool of, of, the, of the neural progenitors, but it doesn't uh, increase the size of the pia, okay? So if you think about it, now we've got two sheets. And the bottom one, the, the, the neural precursors, they're expanding. But the top one, and it's anchored, they're anchored together. It's not expanding. So one way to solve this mechanical problem is to start folding, right? Because then as this can be a longer area than that. And we think essentially that might be the kind of mechanism that gives you these folds. Everything else can go on fairly easily, but there, there has to be basically a buckling uh, due to some sort of buckling forces early in development. Now, that doesn't explain these volcanoes, right? So our tentative explanation for that is that maybe there are some parts of the brain where 
in order to get buckling, you need to detach from the overlying thing. So maybe the skull is actually preventing, the overlying skull is preventing this buckling because these cells are somehow attached to the skull. So what happens if they can't buckle, this area is expanding, these can't expand and they can't buckle either, it rips holes in the pia. Okay? And so we, we've seen some of these holes. In fact, we started looking for the holes in some sense after, after we came up with this model. But uh, what happens to the gradient? What happens to the signaling gradient? This is a part I'm still not sure about, but one possibility is that if you have the holes and the cells that are releasing the signaling molecules are, are linked to the PIA, then the, the, the gradient, instead of being nice and smooth, should have all these little discontinuities here, basically holes in the gradient. If you think about it, then the cells should follow, follow that, uh, these curved gradients, and that might give you the, the kind of volcanoes. So uh, we're very excited about this because at least it's, you know, it's been great for stimulating thought, and I thought maybe someday we can, um, we can really understand how folding happens and maybe get deeper insights into brain development in general. Uh, but there's still a lot of important questions that we need to address in the lab. Uh, one of them is, you know, how do we really test that? Uh, uh, one of the things we're trying now is to actually disrupt PIA, uh, specifically both you can do that pharmacologically and you can do it mechanically and we should be able to basically create volcanoes at will and, and that kind of thing. Uh, that would be, I think, important for us to do. And the other question we're uh, starting to address is what happens to cells when you delay neurogenesis? It's a nice mechanism, it's very powerful, right? You can make a bigger precursor pool, but maybe, you know, by the time you finally get around to spitting out post-mitotic cells, the mechanisms that tell you what to become, well, it's too late for you, right? There were cues earlier available that told you, oh, you should become a deep layer cell or an upper layer cell. If you wait that long to make your, make your neurons, Maybe they can only become upper level neurons or a particular type of neurons and they can no longer have those faces. That's one possibility. Another possibility is it doesn't really matter when you're born because you're carrying an internal program or some sort of clock about, you know. So these are all kinds of mechanisms that we think we can now start to address. It's very confusing though. We've tried to think through these experiments, like what do we expect to see and it gets very messy. But hope I, you know, once we have data, I think it'll become easier. Uh, Another real puzzle is, you know, to be honest, we expected to see an overgrown telencephalon, not tectum, okay? Um, in part because the mammalian data had suggested that, had indicated that when you inject the FGF2 into the ventricles of, a, of an early mouse embryo, you get an overgrown neo, uh, telencephalon. Not so much in our uh, example. So the, the most obvious, uh, thing to do if you want to answer that question is to say, well, what about the receptors, right? Maybe there aren't receptors there. The problem is there are a lot of FGF molecules. There are four receptors, and they all have varying affinities to different things. So it's not there isn't one FGF2 receptor out there. But there's a recent study from uh, Gary Schoenfeld's lab that has looked very carefully at, uh, and mapped out these various FGF, FGF receptors in early chicken embryos. And it really looks like there aren't any relevant uh, uh, receptors relevant to FGF2 in the, in the telencephalon of these early chicken embryos. So that in, at least explains why we don't see anything in the telencephalon. You still might ask, well, why not in areas other than the tectum? Because our effect is certainly strongest in the tectum. So that's something we still have to look into. And then uh, the fourth, of course, there are many more questions, but the fourth one I want to uh, uh, sort of raise here is that I'm aware of sort of an irony is that we're doing these experiments in a chicken embryo. I already told you, they're, they're already the birds with a large tectum. Uh, and maybe that's why when we tweak it, you know, you, you start, we also break this tectum. I mean, these volcanoes, I, I think they're probably disruptive to normal function. Uh, and so I'm in no, in no illusion over that. It'd be interesting to see what if we did this experiment in a species like a parakeet, where maybe we can make it uh, detect them larger without uh, starting uh, to affect it. Or maybe it's the case that every time you, you tweak, you make something larger, you make, try to make the tectum larger with, uh, with delaying neurogenesis, you're going to start breaking it very easily. Uh, 
you know, maybe you start getting volcanoes no matter what you do. Uh, maybe our hypothesis is all wrong. That, that's an interesting idea because that could explain then why, if you look in evolution, normal variation, we don't see that the tectum was enlarged by delaying neurogenesis. Remember I told you it was, to, it was enlarged by shifting these boundaries. And that might be a much more innocuous way of making something larger. You just, early on, you shift a boundary. You can leave everything else the same. There are not going to be any downstream consequences. You can leave everything the same. The problem, of course, with that mechanism of shifting boundaries is, first of all, if you shift one boundary over here, you add to this, you're going to take away from something else, right? You've got to make something else smaller. And the other thing is, it's just not very powerful. You can maybe increase something by, you know, 10%, 20%. At some point, you're going to really encroach on something else. Whereas delaying neurogenesis is really powerful, but it might be hard to control, right? You might, you know, easily get cancers and that kind of thing. So these are the kinds of questions I'm really interested in. And I think I should uh, uh, stop here. I've told all my speakers 40 minutes is really ideal because there's so much firepower in this room, then it's really good to have active discussions, and I'm at 39 minutes and 23 seconds, and I better take myself off the air here, so thank you.